without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Passell. I'm so glad to be back um, at the Free Library. I'm, ex I'm so excited to be launching this new book. And thank you, uh, in the middle of your day, for spending uh, some time with me. And wonderful to see many friendly faces here. And uh, th thank you all so much. You know, I've been a, a lifelong advocate for animals. I loved animals from my earliest years. I watched every nature program I could. I had all of our old encyclopedias dog gear to all the animal entries. Loved my dogs. And it was just part of my natural outlook. And in my first book, which is called The Bond, I argue that we humans have an instinctive connection with other creatures, that we are drawn to animals like a moth is drawn to a flame. And we see this in our current society today, where we have 171 million dogs and cats in our American households. If you add in hamsters and rabbits and other animals, it's 350 million, which eclipses the number of people in households in the US. We have wildlife watching so many of our city parks really reflect the sensibility that even in the height of human civilization within our urban centers, we still want places to be connected to nature. You look at so many channels, Nat Geo, Animal Channel, Discovery, so many other channels have programming with animals and nature. I mean, the whole idea that we're connected to animals is all around us. It's not something we've invented just now. It's been part of the human story for all human history and prehistory. And if you take the really long view of human history and prehistory for 99% of our species time on the planet, we lived as hunters and gatherers. We were immersed in nature. And if you look at surviving tribal societies today, whether it's in the Amazon in Brazil, whether it's in Papua New Guinea, whether it's in the Arctic, all of those tribal societies have animals at their center. Yes, animals are killed in many of these societies, but the members of these communities know all of the animals in their ecological community. Many of them have rituals of apology if they do take the animals' lives. And their whole cosmology and worldview is intertwined in terms of the human and animal relationship. But as I wrote in my first book, there's another side to this story in terms of our human connection to animals. That while we have all of these manifestations of love and appreciation for animals, we also, in this same society, have so much cruelty, so much indifference. And animals are used and exploited in myriad ways. I mean, they're in our food production system. We raise nine billion animals a year for food just in the United States. The average American eats 30 animals a year. I mean, just think of that, 30 animals. The average person consumes that much. So if you think of 320 million people in our country, times 30 is that 9 billion. Globally, it's 77 billion land animals. So for every person, there are 10 farm animals being raised for human consumption. Imagine if the world develops our consumption patterns on animals. We eat more than 200 pounds of meat a year as individuals. Imagine right now if the global ratio is 1 to 10, if it became 1 to 30, there'd be 240 billion animals raised for food. I mean, let's think about our little fragile planet. You know, in 1969 or so, when the first uh, you know, landing on the moon, the astronauts looked back at our small planet within this vast solar system. And they saw this blue and green planet, a tiny little speck in this enormous solar system within a galaxy and so many galaxies beyond that. It showed the whole thing together, this little 
thin zone of life around our small planet. 70% of our Earth's surface is covered by water. Of the remaining 30%, that's land. So much of it is desert. So much of it is rock and ice. So much of it is mountainous. The life zone for the terrestrial creatures of this planet is finite. And we've got 7 billion of us now. It took us all of human history until the early 1820s to get to 1 billion. It took us another 100 years to get to 2 billion. By the 1960s, we had, you know, 3 or 4 billion. And then we've added, you know, in my lifetime, another 3 or 4 billion people to the planet. And all of these animals increasing in number. Imagine if it got bigger in terms of the number of mouths to feed on this planet? I mean, we should never take this planet and its resources for granted. The idea of factory farming, where animals were moved from outdoor settings, where they could feel sunlight on their backs and soil beneath their feet, where yes, they were going to be slaughtered, but at least they had something of a decent life before being slaughtered. You know, that was the norm, was animals were raised in these small agricultural settings, but we transformed all that when we put animals into big buildings and we crowded them into cages and crates barely larger than their bodies, not because of any evil design to hurt the animals, but because we were trying to drive efficiency. We saw greater efficiency in our culture in so many different sectors of our economy, and those models were applied to agriculture. And what we have today is this incredible exploitation of animals on these factory farms. We also have the killing of marine mammals, whether it's whales or seals, for their meat or their fur. We have staged fights between animals, dog fighting and cock fighting. We've got horse slaughter for human consumption. We export American horses from North America to Europe and Asia. We've got animal testing for cosmetics and chemicals. I mean, this is the other side of the equation. We have all this love and appreciation, yet we have so much exploitation of animals and so much of it is embedded in economic institutions and it's built into common practices that so many of us don't even think about. But what is happening today, and the reason I wrote this book, is because we really are experiencing a revolution in our human relationship with animals. It's not been you know, a new idea that's invented. As I said, all of this cultural activity moves in the direction of love and appreciation that I articulated. But what's happened is that we're, we're growing that we're becoming more alert to animals. And one reason is science. Scientists are telling us what we know from a common sense perspective, that these animals feel and they think they have their own lives that matter to them. And in terms of intelligence, they may not be our equals, but they are our equals in terms of their capacity to suffer. And if they're not as intelligent as we are and they, you know, are living more in the moment, then all the more acute they're suffering when we cause them harm and pain. So, you know, I think we're, we're now starting to see that these animals are individuals. And now there's this mass movement of people who really understand that we have responsibilities to other creatures. And I like to say at HSUS that we don't really talk so much about animal rights. We talk more about human responsibility. It's more about us and how we handle our power than it is about the animals. Although, of course, you know, the basic assumption is that, yes, they do matter, and we've got duties to them. And, you know, just going back to, to my own process of awakening on this issue. As I said, I loved animals. But I didn't know about all these problems. You know, into my 
years as a teenager, it wasn't until I got to college where I started to investigate these problems. When I realized that our relationship to animals was a lot more complex and it was a lot more trouble than I thought it was. And now in our information age, with the power of personal computers, with smartphones, with social media, we are now shrinking the distance between our lives and what happens to animals. You know, when we think about you know, getting a dog at a pet store and seeing that cute little puppy, you know, you have an instinctive reaction to be drawn to this creature for all the reasons that I explained. And you may even feel pity that this creature is going to be left alone at night. So you want to take that animal and you'll put down $1,000 or $1,500 for that animal. But what you're not told at the point of sale is what the backstory is. And you know, when I was a kid, as I said, loved animals. My uncle loved animals and he loved these dogs called West Highland Terriers, the white dogs with the black eyes and the black nose. They're so adorable. And he decided to get I come from a large family. My mother had four sisters and two brothers. And he decided to get dogs for most of the family. So we got Randy, and my cousins got Candy, Mandy, and Sandy. <laughs> and they were, they were all purchased from the local pet store. Now, we lived in New Haven, Connecticut. And the papers with Randy from the pet store said that she had come from Kansas. Well, we were really interested. None of us had been to Kansas. We thought, wow, Randy's from Kansas. Isn't that exotic? Isn't that interesting? It's only later in life that I realized that Kansas at that time was the number one puppy mill state in the United States. So we actually, as I said, we lived right in the city and we never had a Pennsylvania SPCA and we didn't have some of the great institutions that you have here in the city. We didn't have a local humane society in New Haven. So the animal control facility was the local police precinct. In fact, you could see the police precinct right from my doorstep. It was across this, this area. You could see the precinct, saw officers going in, and I heard dogs barking. So we loved animals. We wanted to get a pet. Somehow, some way, we got a dog from a thousand miles away who was clearly from a puppy mill rather than going a quarter mile away to save an animal who needed us de desperately. And, you know, I'm sure that one, an one more animal is euthanized because we didn't make the right choice. Now, that wasn't malice. It wasn't, you know, trying to support a puppy mill and trying to cause the euthanasia. It was just ignorance. We did not know. But now, in this era of all of this information exchange, and with so many organizations and so many leaders and public policy, we're now starting to learn what the backstory is for animals. And the changes that I chronicle in the book, which are happening in all different sectors of the economy, are really breathtaking. You know, we announced recently that SeaWorld uh, is going to change many of its practices. They're going to end the breeding of orcas, they're going to end the theatrical shows, they're not going to have any orcas at new facilities they open. They're going to put millions more into rescue and rehabilitation of stranded marine mammals and other marine creatures. They're going to join with us against commercial whaling, shark finning, and commercial seal hunting in Canada. And they're going to change their food policies for their 22 million visitors and their 20,000 employees. They're going to do cage-free eggs, crate-free pork, sustainable seafood, and more plant-based options for all of their facilities. Now, it's not perfect, it's not everything. They still have some troubling practices from our perspective, but is it progress? I mean, you better believe it's progress. And the big defining moment in this cultural debate about marine theme parks that have whales and dolphins and other creatures was, you know, a little documentary that cost, you know, a million dollars to make called Blackfish that turned out to you know, be an extraordinary revelation for so many millions of people. It had a wonderful theatrical release, but then CNN purchased the rights and began to broadcast it. How many of you have seen Blackfish on television? You know, I went and spoke at a business school, the University of Oklahoma in Norman, and all of the students had seen Blackfish. I mean, you know, these kids are 
you know, busy academically. I wouldn't have thought they'd have time, but they all saw it. I mean, the information flow that's happening in our society is extraordinary. And when you layer on top of that information flow our new scientific understanding of animals, and then when you, on top of that, layer the idea that we now all recognize that cruelty to animals is a moral problem. You know, every state in the nation has an anti-cruelty statute. And now every state has felony level penalties for certain malicious acts of cruelty. So it's become a universal value codified in the law, reinforced by our own common sense instincts and our connection with animals, that we should have limits in our conduct in terms of treating these other creatures. So when you think about this universal value, you think about our scientific understanding, you think about the information age that is pushing this information around, and you think about the fundamental goodness of people, many people are acting on this information. And that's why SeaWorld got so much flack and why Blackfish got so many eyeballs. But it's happening everywhere in our society. You know, I mentioned some elements of this agriculture issue and this 50-year experiment that we've had with factory farming where we moved these animals into these windowless buildings and confined them and treated them like widgets or wine bottles. Well, now, just in the last six months, 120 of the biggest brand names in food, Walmart, McDonald's, Burger King, Safeway, Costco, Kroger, you name the company, they've all pledged to us that they're going to phase out their purchase of eggs from hens kept in these extreme confinement operations. They're all going to go cage-free just in the last six months. In 2012, we had a revolution in the pig industry with so many of those same companies saying, we're going to stop purchasing pork from operations that confine the sows. You know, I grew up in New Haven with a big Italian-American community. The big, you know, dish when we'd go out is veal parmesan. You know, it, it was part of our culture. It was part of the cuisine within the Italian-American community. But I and so many millions of Americans learned what happens to those veal calves, that they're kept in a 22-inch wide crate. They're immobilized so they can't move. Their muscles don't develop. So when they're slaughtered, their meat is tender. And they're kept in a deliberate state of anemia. They're denied iron so their flesh will be pale. I mean, what kind of madness is this that we do that to a living, feeling creature? I mean, it is shameful. But somehow, you know, we're so removed from it that it's okay. I mean, we're not thinking about it. We just want our, you know, we're hungry. We, you know, we have this great palate. We want good taste in our mouth. We want convenience. So for those elements, which are all normal human instincts, we subordinate the concern about the well-being and welfare of animals to the point where we had kind of systematized exploitation and abuse of millions and billions of animals. Now, finally, we're starting to change. And the other revolution that's happening in this food area is food technologists are showing us that we can actually replicate all of the things that we like about meat in foods without harming the animals. So I talk about companies like Hampton Creek, which is producing a plant-based egg substitute. It has all of the protein of eggs. It has all of the binding qualities of eggs. But it doesn't have any animals involved. The scientists are mining the world's thousands of plants and finding that mix of them and emulsifying and they're heating and they're doing all these sorts of things to create this plant-based protein that mirrors all of the best qualities of eggs without any of the worst dimensions of it. None of the fat, none of the cholesterol, none of the animal cruelty. Now, so many eggs, the average American eats 264 eggs a year. So there's ba that's basically the number of eggs a modern laying hen produces in a year. So for every person who eats eggs, there's some chicken working for you producing those eggs. So the number of hens in production matches almost entirely the U.S. population. 
So we've got about 300 million people. We have about 300 million laying hens. Most of those 264 eggs are baked into products that you don't even realize that there's an egg there. It's baked into cookies and cakes and, you know, all sorts of things, waffles and pancakes and things that really are so many staples. Now, if you knew that a company could produce the pancake or the waffle or the cookie or the cake, and it would be a functional equivalent for you in terms of protein and other nutrients, but didn't involve, and, and you know, quality, just in terms of the taste and the binding properties. I mean, wouldn't you choose if it, if it was a functional equivalent or even functionally superior? I mean, it's no skin off your back. You just choose something in the marketplace that is equal or superior. Well, that's where we are at this point with Hampton Cree. And we're doing the same thing with plant-based proteins that can mimic the properties of chicken or beef or pork. I mean, think about all of the revolutions that we've ha had in our lifetimes. Or think about the revolutions we've had in American history. I mean, at one point, the notion of flight was a crazy notion, that a, you know, a metal clanking machine would get up in the air. And how about the idea of a metal machine flying you know, 7,000 miles across the planet? Crazy. Computers, you know, at one point were a crazy idea. The automobile was a crazy idea at one point. I mean, think of how things are changing now. My first year in college, I typed my papers on a typewriter. Then we had personal computers. Who could have imagined just a few years later the smartphone? So is it that fanciful and that crazy that our great human brain with all of our ingenuity could not produce facsimiles of these proteins and other food items that can be great for us in terms of our nutritional needs and meet all of our needs in terms of taste and texture. That's what food revolutionists are doing right now, entrepreneurs and innovators in laboratories and, and warehouses in a number of parts of the United States. We are going to see great changes we have already seen great change. And of course, you know, Philadelphia is known for this, it's great vegan fare. I mean, you've got one of the best restaurants of any kind in veg uh, here in Philadelphia. And then there's V Street and you've got so many other uh, incredible places in Philadelphia. I mean, you've become a mecca for, for uh, vegan cuisine and vegan fare. So that's another revolution. A third one that I talk about in the book is in film and you know, movies, television. You know, if you look at the history of American film, obviously there are a lot of different things you can focus on, but if you're thinking about the animals, the Westerns, they had horses that were, were tripped, they were galloping at full pace, and they, they put a tripwire out there so all the horses would, you know, would fall down at once to create some sort of scene that the, that the director wanted. There were primates like orangutans abused in films. I talked to some of the leading directors in writing my book. I talked to Darren Aronofsky, who did Black Swan and he did The Wrestler, you know, an award-winning uh, director. He also took on the project of a major theatrical release of Noah. And if there's any movie that has a high degree of difficulty in representing animals, it would be Noah, which of course tells the story of the ark and the saving of creation, all of God's creation, saving all these creatures. And he realized that, you know, I could go to the, these animal acting places that supply the movies with animals, and I could get some camels, and I could get some goats, and maybe I could even get a few wild animals, but he'd have 20, 30, maybe at most 40 pairs of animals, it would be a great expense. You know, there'd be all sorts of chaos on the set. Or he can use computer generated imagery and get every kind of animal in the world, have no problems in terms of chaos, zero animal cruelty, and he could keep animals at the center of the story. He could actually do better filmmaking. And I talked to the folks who wrote Dawn of Planet of the Apes 
and rise of Planet of the Apes, you know, where you have these very intelligent great apes, the chimpanzees and the gorillas. I mean, are they going to have this moral problem of using these great apes in film? And if you're going to have a scene where great apes are battling humans and there are hundreds of apes, how are you going to get that? Well, they did it with performance capture technology where they had human actors and they had sensors all over the actors' bodies. And they were filming this and they had computers measuring movements. And they told me then that when they were watching Andy Serkis, a famous actor who played the part of Caesar, they, he was dressed in a white bodysuit. And people were crying when he was performing his scene. It was so vivid and so real. So the human actor was at the center of the movie, but then they imposed the image of the great ape upon him. And this is the wonder of computer-generated imagery and these new technologies that are allowing us to leave behind that sort of cruelty. And we're seeing it in live entertainment. I mentioned SeaWorld. It was just a little more than a year ago that Ringling Brothers, after facing a lot of pressure from leaders like, like the councilman here on animal welfare, many municipalities said, we don't want these elephants and all the cruelty. And so many locales were banning them. Well, Ringling said, okay, we can't fight City Hall any longer. We're going to end the use of elephants. And on May 1st, all of the Ringling elephants will be officially retired. So just in uh, less than two weeks. So the point of all of this is that what's happening in society is that so many corporations, whether they're food and ag, whether they're cosmetic industry or chemical industry, whether it's entertainment, whether it's wildlife management, whether it's fashion, they're now recognizing that having animal cruelty baked into the business model is a risk. It's a threat to them. They're going to be courting lawsuits. They're going to be courting protests. They're going to be eroding their brand in a world where we're now alert to the capacities and qualities of animals in a culture where we hate animal cruelty. And they're recognizing, they're recognizing that there are now opportunities. So it's not as if when you advocate for animals, you have to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your freedoms. You have to sacrifice your convenience. You have to sacrifice profits. They're now recognizing when we make the right choices for animals, we have new opportunities. We have new opportunities for growth. SeaWorld, you know, if it had 25% or 30% of the American public that would never go to their their theme parks. Now, if they do the right thing, if they continue to evolve, they could have 100% of the people interested. If they have roller coasters and water features and so many of these innovative things that any of the theme parks are now experimenting with and having great success, now they can have 100% of the people coming to their places. They can double their, their revenues. They can double their profits. That's what's happening in all of these different sectors. But it has always taken a small group of people, whether they're innovators, whether they're engineers, whether they're advocates in our field who have always pushed issues onto the radar screen. You know, you look at the history of our American culture. We're not the same society now that we were 10 years ago or 30 or 50 or 100 or 200. You know, we're a nation that was founded on some extraordinary principles of fairness and justice. You know, consult the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Yet for 80 years of our American history, we had chattel slavery. For 120 years, we denied half the population, women, the right to vote. Within the last 60 years, we have had huge struggles over civil rights where people bled and sacrificed to make our society better. But step by step, reform by reform, piece by piece, we're becoming a more humane, a more compassionate, a more caring society. We're creating a civil society. That's what we want. You know, it's not just about us as individuals, it's about 
us as individuals within the whole of society. And whether you consult our American traditions in terms of our political thought or you consult our religious traditions that say, you know, love your neighbor, care for all of God's creation, whatever the sort of origin of your closely held values, it all leads us to the same place, which is more decency, more mercy, more goodness in society. And why should the animals be left out of that equation? They shouldn't. There is no question that we have the capacity as a species to solve these problems of animal exploitation and cruelty. It is an issue of will. It's an issue of intentionality. And yes, we're going to experiment with these things. We're going to have to figure it out. When the first computers came out, they were certainly in relative terms, they were slow and clunky. Every year we get better at it. If we put our mind to making this a humane society and building a humane economy where we marry our values with our commerce, that's the society we want. You know, we don't want a nation where you go to work, you leave your values behind. We live in a capitalist economy. The businesses drive so much of the activity in our society. They produce the goods and the services that are the centerpiece of who we are as a nation. Why would we ever omit core values? And animal cruelty and opposition to animal cruelty is now a core value. It's time to recognize for everyone in society that cruelty to animals is wrong and that we need to logically apply anti-cruelty principles in a world where animals are used in so many different sectors of the economy. So I'm absolutely convinced that we can do this. I wrote this book to really talk about animal protection not as sacrifice but as opportunity, to really embrace the notion of human uniqueness and the notion that yes, we can solve these issues and that economics is now in favor of animal protection in every arena in which we are working. So when you do layer over our moral imperative to do the right thing and then remind people that there are profits to be had by doing the right thing, what a difficult set of ideas to resist. So th thank you all very, very much. Thanks for coming midday. And uh, council member, thank you so much for your great leadership on so many issues. Can you speak a little bit about the ag gag bills? I mean, is that just the death throw of a dying sort of model or is there something more? So the question is about state legislation popularly referred to as ag gag legislation. So, you know, when we and others have taken on this issue of animal agriculture and specifically industrialized animal agriculture, we knew that there was going to be a kickback. I mean, look at any successful social movement and you will see a corresponding sort of, you know, strike back from those entrenched in positions of power and who have depended upon the continuation of the status quo. So ag-gag, of course, was a very specific response to keep the curtain closed on America's factory farms. You know, we are, as I said, we're so deeply disassociated from our food production system. I tell, uh, I, I talk to, to a guy and I, I, I talk about him and his, his, his uh, story and, and his book in, in my book. And he wrote a book called Every 12 Seconds. And his name is Timothy Patrat. He's an academic. He, at the New School in New York, he decided to, I mean, really not because he was an animal activist, but he was a cultural anthropologist. He went and he worked at a slaughterhouse in Omaha, Nebraska for six months. He worked on the slaughterhouse floor. And he diagrammed the floor. And he, he said there were 120 positions that were, were identified by the plant management. And four of them were involved in killing the animal. So they get the animal, these are cattle, and every 12 seconds, 
the reason he called it was that's how, how when the lines were running at full pace, that's how frequently a, a, a cow was, was slaughtered. So they put the animal, uh, somebody, you know, gets the animal, they come on a truck, and then they herd them up the chute, and they put them in the kill box. And then someone's supposed to stun the animal, and then they cut the animal's throat, or they, you know, they, they kill them in whatever way they're killing them. Usually, you know, they're, they're cutting them, and then they're exsanguinating them. So all the blood comes out, they tip them upside down, and then they've got somebody who pulls off you know, the leg, and somebody pulls off part of the skin, and, you know, somebody takes the head off, and somebody takes the organs out, and he talked about this because several of the cows escaped one day. They ran from the pre-slaughter area, and they ran into downtown Oklahoma, uh, Omaha, and some of the plant workers ran out, and there were police, I mean, it was a big, you know, issue. I mean, we're not used to, in this modern age, having cows running around an urban center. So they were able to get some of the cows uh, back, but there was one who kept eluding every, everybody who was trying to get him, and he was behaving a little bit aggressively, and the police made a decision to shoot the cow, and some of the workers saw it, and they were outraged by it. Now, those other cows that had been collected went back into the, into the pre-slaughter area and were probably going to be slaughtered you know, in a couple of hours, and they went to the lunchroom, Patcherat said, and they were furious, and they were, you know, why did the police kill this animal? So even on the slaughterhouse floor, just in terms of the psychology of this whole situation, people were removed from the idea of killing, right? So they weren't directly involved in killing if they were like 10 slots away from the person who was finishing off the animal, or 20 slots, or 40 slots. We are so compartmentalized in society. Imagine if those people could be disconnected from it, imagine the rest of us in our society. And I think what the ag community feared more than anything was exposure of the routine violence in the industry. And they saw that we and Mercy for Animals and other organizations were getting folks hired at some of the factory farms and slaughterhouses and we were putting it on YouTube or we were getting it on the nightly news. And it proved a revelation because it's been hidden so long that it's no longer normal. Now, if you saw this violence every single day, you would become dull to it. But we're not dull to it because it's so removed from our daily experience. So it's a vulnerability for the industry. So they tried to pass legislation to forbid taking pictures or video or to apply for a job if you're an animal advocate. And I do think it is a gasp of the industry, but you know, we're not, this is an ongoing process. We've got a lot of other problems in American agriculture. I think what we've seen with our work over the last few years is that we now have the end in sight for extreme confinement of animals on factory farms. I mean, that will all go away within the next few years. Then we've got a number of other issues in agriculture, such as, you know, fast growth of broiler chickens and, you know, other mutilations, transport, you know, these fast slaughter lines that stress the animals. So lots of different issues, but there are many different expressions of, of uh, the backlash. There were bills in Oklahoma and Missouri this year to make it a civil penalty for um, animal welfare groups that lobby or do national programs to solicit contributions in those states. I mean, they're trying to block our funding. So it comes in many different forms. When we were in uh, Europe recently, I bought some body wash, and stamped on that package was a little bunny, which indicated that it was developed without animal cruelty. And I was wondering, you know, I'm seeing all the names of the organizations that are producing humane food. Are we going to have any identifiers, or is anybody thinking about doing that in the country, like when the consumer goes to the grocery, should I buy this or that? Great question, and yes, you know, now it's becoming unusual not to see a marker on a cosmetic that, that does not indicate it's cruelty-free, and we now have hundreds of companies that have made the pledge. We're now trying to codify that no testing standard by passing the Humane Cosmetics Act in Congress. So the labels were designed to kind of be a flag to consumers to make the right choice. The market is working, companies are modifying their policies, and then you go to the lawmaking part of our society, 
to codify that standard. So we are now seeing the beginnings of a, a process of labeling of food products, which many in the industry have long been resisting, to give consumers more information. And clearly the pioneer in this field has been Whole Foods Market. Whole Foods Market uh, has animal products at its stores that are labeled under a rating program called the Global Animal Partnership. And rather than just say kind of humane or nothing, which is you know what you were talking about is like the leaping bunny program, no animal testing. So it's either no testing or there's testing. With the use of animals in agriculture, there are lots of different animal welfare measures. I mean, how were they handled at slaughter and what was the transportation and were they in confinement, were they mutilated? You know, what's their, their chronic condition because of the breeding practices? So Whole Foods with Global Animal Partnership developed a five-step rating program. So if you go to Whole Foods and you see pork at level one, it means the animals were not in a crate. If you go to pick the product that says level two, it means that they were not subject to mutilation. Three means they had access to pasture. Four means entirely pasture-based, never inside except for refuge at night if they need to you know, be protected from the elements or predators. And five is slaughtered on the farm. So they don't have to transport them you know, 10 miles or 1,000 miles to get to a slaughter plant. So this is the beginning of a process of, at point of purchase, telling that backstory. Because you see a piece of pork. I mean, you cannot really distinguish unless you really know a lot about the industry, like a wine person, a sommelier, who can tell you where, <laughs> where the wine comes from. You can't tell where that pig comes from. You can't tell how he or she was treated. So we need information. And then good people act on that information and then drive change in society. So what we want is for the other big food retailers to make these the, the GAP standard, the one, and I also want to do a shout out to a, a great Philadelphia-based company, Aramark. Aramark is a great leader on the food issue. They uh, uh, developed the no uh, gestation crate policy some years ago. They were one of the first on the issue of, of uh, cage-free eggs. They're now doing plant-based options for their food service program. This is a big Fortune 500 company that's really doing important work in this regard. And this is what it takes. Companies that are conscious and aware and thinking about how their business practices affect animal welfare. Hi, um, I realize a lot of these changes come from uh, local and state levels. And I was curious, um, are there any, you know, or private companies doing, you know, choosing to do it, to do it themselves? Is there anything at the federal level um, that's pending or we could, you know, work on changing. And if I missed it, I apologize, but is there a, um, on the terms, solely on, you know, getting these issues done at the federal level, is there any public endorsement of uh, presidential candidates that the Humane Society, you know, is on supporting? The on the first issue, before you cede the mic, um, what, what was there, in terms of congressional legislation, was there a particular issue that you were thinking about? Was it agriculture or all animals that you were thinking about? Well, all animals, such as regulation of, like what SeaWorld is doing. I see. Choosing to yeah. do, okay, that's, they really weren't legally forced to do that, they chose to do it. Yes. Um, Ringland Brothers, you know, there's a lot of circuses out there that are still using elephants. Correct. You know, so is there any, change pending at the federal level for that. Yeah, and no, I get your question. Thank you for it. So last night, I was fortunate enough, we had the, the pre-launch event for the, for the humane economy. Um, I had an event with Cory Booker, a U.S. Senator from New Jersey, and he's an ardent animal protection person and a great leader on our issues. Great leader. Unbelievable. Never seen a guy like this before. And he is carrying legislation right now to, to stop not to stop entirely, but to create a standard that's going to dramatically reduce uh, animal testing for risk assessment for chemicals, thousands of chemicals that are in commercial use in our society, on our chairs and on our bags, and chemicals are everywhere. So we've got 30 or 40 pieces of major federal legislation on animal protection. So you can go to the humanesociety.org and go to our federal legislative page and you can get a full roster. And we've got a 501c4 organization called the Humane Society Legislative Fund 
if you become a member of that group, you'll get our Humane Activist newsletter and it lists all the federal bills and then we tag which bills have action and which bills we think we can get moving. So if you also are on our humanestudy.org website, if you signed up through the website to get our email alerts, we tell you about pending federal legislation as well as pending state legislation, whether it's banning pigeon shoots or stopping dog tethering uh, in Harrisburg. And we want people involved because this is how things change. Us as individuals, you know, we have a certain amount of power. But when collectively thousands or millions of us start hammering these issues, that's when change really happens. In terms of the presidential race, the Humane Society of the United States is a charity and it's forbidden from endorsing candidates. So no charity, like a 501c3 group, can get involved in candidate elections. They can't get involved in issue elections, like Prop 2 in California, which was stopping confinement, or when we did a ballot measure in Oklahoma to outlaw cockfighting. But the Humane Society Legislative Fund can make endorsements in races, and it hasn't yet made an endorsement in the presidential race. Uh, Humane Society has been talking to a number of the campaigns and now uh, both Secretary Clinton and Senator Stander Sanders have uh, animal protection policy statements on their websites. I'm not aware of the Republican candidates having any of that yet. Uh, we hope they do um, uh, enumerate some pro-animal positions, but so far it's just the Democrats. We do, uh, before the election, uh, the, the, the the general election, these are the primaries coming up next week in Pennsylvania, uh, but typically for the general elections, we do offer a roster of endorsements and we don't look at their record on abortion or uh, taxes or other issues as important as all of those issues are for the, our society. We feel that our responsibility is to evaluate the candidates just on animal welfare issues, how they've responded to questionnaires and if they're a standing elected official, how they've uh, cast their votes in the past on important issues. Speed question, it's a quick one. Okay. What is your biggest challenge for the remainder of 2016? Hmm. That's a toughie though. I know. Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges right now is, and I wouldn't say it's just 2016, but it's a big issue. We're, we've really started a campaign to end the uh, practice of eating dogs in Asia. And South Korea is the only nation in the world that has dog farms. It has 17,000 dog meat farms. And we have rescued hundreds and hundreds of dogs, but we're just scratching the surface. We need to work with the government there and business and the trade association for the dog meat farmers to find a new pathway and end this horrific cruelty uh, to these dogs. Uh, but one terrible circumstance in my work at HSUS is the incredible panoply of issues. We have so many subjects. Uh, we're active in more than 50 countries. We're active in every single state. I mean, it's like a Rubik's Cube, all of the things that we've got going on. And to solve it requires constant guess, thought and, and attention. And um, again, I'm so thankful for your being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>